Okay, welcome everyone. Hello, good morning from Washington DC. Good afternoon and um, good middle of the night to those of you joining us uh, from Asia and uh, the Pacific. Um, I'm Emily Slater, the Executive Director of the Bretton Woods Committee, and I'm delighted to have this fantastic panel of speakers with us today to discuss the important topic of anti-corruption. Um, we want to save most of the time for them, so I'm going to be very brief uh, and just a few housekeeping notes. As always, we will reserve time for audience Q&A. Um, if you do have a question, we ask that you please submit it using the Q&A function in the Zoom toolbar, and then we will call on individuals and we'll ask that you unmute your microphones so you can pose your questions directly to the speakers. And now let me just quickly introduce them. Um, we have with us today, Edward Olowo Okeri, who leads the World Bank's public sector and financial management team in the global governance practice. We also have Lisa Keelar Courtney, who is the director of the Prevention and Compliance Division of the Office of Anti-Corruption and Integrity at the Asian Development Bank. We have Han Juncker, who's the executive secretary of Greco, the group of states against corruption. Also have with us Chinwe Ezemai, who's managing director and chief anti-bribery officer at Citigroup. And we have Frank Vogel, who is the co-founder of two anti-corruption NGOs, Transparency International and the Partnership mm -hmm. for Transparency Fund. And last but certainly, certainly not least, we have um, Bill Rhodes, who will be moderating today's discussion. And Bill wears many hats, um, one of them, of course, being vice chair of BWC. So, Bill, thanks for your leadership. And I will kick it off, uh, send it over to you to kick off today's discussion. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Emily. And I would say it's a great pleasure to open this discussion today about anti-corruption, which is such a central, uh, I think, concern of all of us at Bretton Woods. And particularly, I should remember Jim Wolfenson, former head of the World Bank, who was also one of the past leaders of Bretton Woods. He, I think, did much to convince not only the World Bank the, of the importance of fighting corruption, but also many of the other development banks around the world. And of course, another of one of our great leaders <clears throat> who unfortunately has also passed on was Paul Volcker, former chairman of the New York Federal Reserve, who was very passionate about anti-corruption inquiries uh, <clears throat> and worked on these issues, uh, both at the United Nations uh, and the World Bank. So inspired, <clears throat> I think, by uh, Wolf, Wolfenson and Volker, I want to open today's discussion uh, and ask you to give uh, some short answers uh, to some of the questions that I'm going to pose to you, and hopefully we can get through all of them. Uh, I think one of the things we should keep in mind is that uh, President Biden released his National Security Council's first memorandum last year on the issue of corruption and national security. Uh, then in December, he held uh, this famous Summit for Democracy, where anti-corruption was one of the major themes. Um, and I think directly after uh, the summit, the Biden administration released its own anti-corruption strategy and many governments stated that they would be making pledges to raise their anti-corruption uh, efforts. So my first question is why the heightened focus on anti-corruption, on money laundering and kleptocracy right now? Frank, uh, your excellent provocative new book has just been published uh, titled The Enablers about how titled, subtitled, how the West supports kleptocrats and co corruption in uh, <clears throat> endangering our democracy and the democracies around the world. So why don't we start off with you on this subject? Thank you very much, Bill. And uh, <clears throat> it's, a, it's an honor to be with such a distinguished panel and such a terrific audience. Um, you mentioned Paul Volcker. Uh, let me start, if I may, by uh, turning to my book and quoting uh, Paul Volcker. Just before he died, he penned a, an absolutely marvelous memoir, um, must reading, I think, for everybody. And in his memoir, Paul ended by saying, um, I end this memoir with a sense of deep concern, the rising tide of progress toward open democracies uh, is turning away. The world in which I have lived and served seems to, ebb seems to be ebbing away. So your question, 
Bill is why now? And I uh, should say that we are in a terrible situation in the world when we look at the challenge between authoritarianism and democracy. And we, democracy has been in retreat for a decade. The Economist Intelligence Unit's Democracy Index that came out exactly one year ago said uh, global democracy has had a very bad year, partly because of all of the abuses under, uh, added to by COVID. The new democracy index comes out in the next week or two. I think the results will be worse. So we say, why now? Alexander Navalny is in prison in Russia. Yamal Khashoggi was murdered by the Saudis. Their crimes, they sought to tell the truth about the corruption and abuse by their governments. And across the world today, more journalists have been imprisoned for trying to speak truth to power to expose corruption than ever before. The Center for, uh, for Protecting Journalists says it's a historic high of 293 journalists now in prison right now. And civil society space across the world has been sharply reduced. And many of my colleagues in many civil society organizations are under enormous pressure in many parts of the world. In Belarus, in Sudan, in Myanmar, they're just killing activists, jailing activists. Uh, and why? Because these are thoroughly kleptocratic states. Uh, I've been active in this anti-corruption area, highly active, since co-founding Transparency International 30 years ago. And since 1995, TI has published a Corruption Perception Index. And today, thanks to Emily Slater and the Bretton Woods Committee, uh, they've convened this panel on the day that the new index is being released. And what does today's index show? It shows a worse condition than before. Out of 180 countries, two thirds are either ranked as corrupt or very corrupt. That's the governments. Uh, 27 countries have a historically bad rating this year. The comparisons with the past are absolutely awful. And it makes us say there's a crisis right now. And a crisis demands far more action than I think we are seeing across the world. I wrote this book because I'm not just concerned about what's happening in the developing countries, but also in the leading industrial countries. Uh, because thanks to bankers, thanks to real estate brokers, thanks to lawyers on Wall Street and the city of London, we have, we have seen hundreds of billions of dollars of money laundering going into Western markets from authoritarian kleptocracies. And we are responsible. We're responsible. This is a universal problem. It's a global problem. It's not just one of the uh, of the South. And we are now at a critical, critical juncture. The aiding and abetting of Putin and Xi and all these other kleptocrats when it comes to money is done by the enablers on our shores. And we are actually paying token interest to what they're doing with absolutely inadequate enforcement against the major banks and all those other enablers. Let me just end, uh, because I'm trying to be very brief, and just say this. Greco does some tremendous work. Uh, it has exposed time and again, <clears throat> real faults in many countries. <clears throat> and you have to say, but why hasn't there been the political follow-up that it really demands? The World Bank, the Asian Development Bank, commercial banks are doing a lot in terms of compliance. They're doing a lot in terms of anti-corruption, but frankly, it's all business as normal. And my argument today is we have a crisis. I've tried to give you some data. That demands that as we look at 2022, we have to step up what's been going on. And I appeal to you in this, in this opportunity we have this morning, to my fellow panelists, tell us what you're gonna do that's additional in 2022. 
Let's not hear about all the wonderful things you've done in the past, which I know are great. Tell us what you're going to do next. Because if we don't all get together and do far, far more, the kleptocrats win, democracy loses, our security is at risk. So, Bill, thank you for letting me open this up. Thank, thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much, Frank. Ed, can we start with, off with you? Hey, thanks, uh, Bill, mm -hmm. and thanks for the invite. Uh, it's really an honor to be here this uh, morning. So I will try to uh, just complement uh, what uh, Frank has said, because I think Frank already provided the, a broader context of why the heightened attention uh, to corruption. Um, so a few points from my side. One, uh, the leaks. OK, now days we see uh, a steady flow of leaks of data and information. And each time there is a leak, there is a spotlight on corruption across the globe. Um, the enablers that uh, Frank mentioned, uh, the leaks are also highlighting or spotlighting uh, uh, their role in corruption. Then we also have the social media. Uh, with the social media, it has become more difficult for any government to control the flow of information. So we all get to know about corruption and so on and so forth. Uh, another point is that I think we have youths that are more vibrant now and are paying attention to governance issues. Uh, we've seen uh, those youths uh, protesting in many countries. I mean, examples, the Arab Springs, uh, we saw the, the, what triggered that was essentially a, a corruption. And I mean, they are seeing uh, the impact of corruption on their ability to have good education, to be gainfully employed, and to have a decent living standard. Uh, they, Frank also mentioned the civil society that the space is being crossed, but the rise of civil society is also part of what is uh, increasing their attention uh, to corruption because they are taking up some of these issues with government. They go into court, they organizing uh, demonstrations in some countries. And so this is also helping uh, to draw attention to corruption. Then we also have corruption analytics. Okay, mm -hmm. Frank mentioned the uh, transparency index that is just being released now. Uh, each time you release it, there is a debate about it. And that also draw attention to corruption. And finally, COVID-19. We saw, I mean, the misuse of funds, stories <clears throat> about that and so on and so forth, and how that could really affect the effectiveness of governments. So uh, really, I think people are fed up with corruption, and that's why there is heightened attention to it. Thanks, Bill. Thank you, Ed. <clears throat> Hannah, why don't you give your thoughts, because I know you spend a lot of time on this subject, even apart from your own uh, professional work. Me? Sorry, Hannah? Yes. Yeah, yes. Sorry, I couldn't hear you. Hello, hello. Thank you very much for inviting me to this excellent event. I would just make three uh, points in this connection. One is one factor that might be pushing corruption higher up the agenda was already partly mentioned by Frank, which is this partial retreat from the rule of law, which we see in some of our European countries, which of course, cause result in this concentration of power and weakening of safeguards. And all of this completely undermines our institutions and trust in those institutions. So it, it's a really serious issue. And what it does is create environments where corruption can flourish. And that is unfortunately often the point of, of these changes that are being made. So I would point to these threats to the rule of law. I would also point to, that was already mentioned by uh, Mr. Lobo Kerry just now, the, the work done by investigative yes. journalists, the Pandora papers, for example, which help, they create a little bit of momentum, maybe a little bit of outrage and make it more difficult for politicians to at least ignore the issue. So I think that's a huge value and everything related to freedom of the media, access to information, this is, this is key and, and part of the crisis. Mm. And then maybe the last point I would mention is a trend that we see, which is that corruption is mainstreamed across all sorts of sectors. So sports, education, gender equality, environmental crime, <clears throat> uh, management, <clears throat> wage flows, all sorts of things, which again means it comes up a lot more. And that helps because then we can raise it in all sorts of contexts and, and trying to, to bring it into the conversation. And then finally, just on COVID, absolutely agree that this has really shifted powers to the executive in a way we haven't seen that I can't remember having seen that and also making exceptions and strange arrangements look justified and normal which is never a good thing and we have to make sure that at least when the pandemic eventually disappears that these types of things 
are also not do not become standard practice. I would think. Say, so I leave it there. Thanks. All right. Thank you very much, Chinwei. Why don't you give your thoughts, looking at from the <clears throat> private sector banking area? Yes, absolutely. And I think I would just echo what Frank and Ed and also Han have mentioned. I think the the um the key themes that we're seeing are the impact of COVID exacerbating corruption issues. So that so the impact of corruption has been well documented. So the impact on on economies, the impact of the poorest of the poor, and the impact on um access to development. So so we know those numbers. We know the <laughs> over $1 trillion impact that the World Economic Forum has documented. But what we're seeing is, as our as the fellow panelists noted, is um, COVID with a lack of transparency and also the shift to virtual. The fact that now a lot more is happening online and the fact that fraudsters are leveraging that opportunity to drive their agenda. The third thing I would also um, highlight as well, which you mentioned um, at the outset of the call bill is the Biden memo. I think it's really critical the fact that the US president has noted that corruption is a national security issue. And um, again, underscoring throughout the uh, president's strategy, the fact that now we will be looking across the different impacts of corruption and ensuring that the enforcement actions are funded. So I, I think most of the themes we've already hit on and I look forward to digging deeper into a few of those. Thank you very much, Lisa. From down under. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So um, I think the uh, other aspect to think of too is um, in these very trying times, um, it's been alluded to here that we've got governance, uh, government approvals that are fast tracked. So we've got a serious risk of undue influence over policy responses, um, undue influence over lobbying, and also that the controls are weakened. So we've seen this significant flows of funds and injections of funds into economies to try and help stabilise the uh, budget, to prop up healthcare, uh, significant rollout of vaccine programs, and uh, the... the um, the allocation of the vaccines, et cetera. So we've got spending pressure, lower controls and higher risk. So it's, it's, it's a perfect bedfellow. And then when you look at um, project key risks, we've also got market constraints. So we've got market uh, power where the markets have shifted from um, from a uh, buyer, uh, buyer demand to, to supplier power, uh, time to go to market, um, contract balance. So we've seen many, many contracts that are being uh, entered into with quite some speed, but they've got significant uh, non-disclosure agreements. So there's quite often not transparency to the public on what's going on. There may be insufficient capacity in developing member countries to implement uh, and deploy with their infrastructure, their internal processing, their skills, um, and also the controls within um, these projects actually weaken, uh, but literally because of the speed of implementing what needs to be implemented, whether it's popping up the supply chain, vaccine programs, or the like. So there's stresses going on uh, throughout all projects and all supply chains, and it's making it um, a, a another rich environment for fraud, corruption, bribery, conflicts of interest, and all the nefarious mm. bedfellows. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, my second question uh, follows up on Frank's point about <clears throat> Transparency International releasing their new report. And Ed, I'd like to hear from you how you think of concretely that, uh, in the sense of what your organization is planning to do over the next 12 months uh, to boost your anti-corruption efforts uh, in, you know, in light of this uh, very bad report that just come out from Transparency International. Uh, thanks, uh, Bill. So I will try and be brief. I mean, as a bank, uh, we are aware of the ample effect of corruption on development and the challenges that this poses to the World Bank goals of poverty elimination and shared prosperity. So we have constantly focused on efforts to prevent corruption in the projects that we finance, okay? We also work with 
government to also try to generally address issues of corruption uh, across uh, uh, development programs, regardless of the source of financing. So let me say one thing <clears throat> briefly about what we are going to be doing from the World Bank side on the projects that we finance, okay? We are continuing to strengthen our robust fiduciary framework, uh, taking advantage of advances in technology, uh, especially with the use of blockchain and artificial intelligence. So we already have activities underway to unleash the power of these technologies uh, to be able to strengthen what is already a golden fiduciary standard in the international development uh, arena. Now, let me then turn to what we are also planning to do uh, to support the clients as well. Uh, we are scaling up efforts uh, to support clients to implement <clears throat> tech, uh, in various countries. And the whole idea of this is that by implementing GovTech, it can reduce or minimize the interaction between human beings and then reduce opportunities to be able to ask for and receive bribes. Uh, similarly, we are supporting reforms in procurement and in uh, beneficial uh, ownership uh, transparency. Uh, we are also focusing on the application of advanced data analytics. For instance, we do have a procurement anti-corruption and transparency platform, which provides access to 21 million contracts across the world currently. Uh, it's in prototype stage and we are seeking feedback on that. Then finally, we are developing an anti-corruption action plan to consolidate a new approach to the World Bank's work on anti-corruption, drawing on our enhanced knowledge of what works and what does not work in terms of controlling corruption in client countries. Let me stop there. Thank you very much, uh, Ed Chenwei. Thank you, Bill. So yeah, so City has, I think a number of folks may be aware, City does business in over 160 countries. We have physical presence in about 100 countries. So we have a large global footprint. And so we've long recognized the importance of anti-corruption. Mm -hmm. We've recognized the importance of enabling progress in the communities where we serve and also doing it through responsible finance. And we've also been very active in cooperating both with a number of organizations who we're speaking to today but across you know, the World Economic Forum working groups, the OECD Blue Dot Network is one that we're participating in actively this year, and also in the past, Wolfsburg as well as this year. City also has a long history of partnering closely with law enforcement in connection with suspicious activities, in connection with organized crime, breaking up organized crime networks, including child trafficking and other forms of corruption. With regard to uh, 2022, we have created, this actually kicked off in 2021, City created a financial crimes unit. So we've always had anti-money laundering, sanctions, anti-bribery, and global financial crimes investigations. But one of the things we've done is we've formalized that uh, coordination across the different units to ensure that we are more effectively connecting the dots and strengthening um, the, the strong foundation that we already have in place. And some of you may be aware that in mm. enforcement actions <clears throat> involving some large institutions, mm. one of the things our regulators have pointed out is the importance of that coordination across the various units. We're also highly focused on data as well. As I noted mm. in my opening remarks, the importance of data, we're focused on em emerging and digital assets and digital cur currencies and also strengthening artificial intelligence and other forms of automation solutions. So I will stop there in terms of priorities for the year and turn it back over to you, Bill. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Chin Wei. It's very good to, to see what the private sector and hear what the private sector uh, is doing. Lisa, let me turn it to you now. Um, thanks, William. So um, with the, uh, what we've had to do, like many other organisations, is we've had to pivot to a remote environment. Um, so all our activities have been remote and continue to be remote. Uh, in saying that, what we've done is we've adapted a number of our modalities to address risk. So um, we undertake something called a proactive integrity review on selected sovereign projects. And what we've done is we've actually adapted that uh, that product, so to speak, um, to something we call a special 
social proactive reviews, and they allow us to rapidly identify and assess emerging risks in targeted areas. So very thematic, um, instead of the, the full gambit of a, uh, a proactive integrity review. And so we launched that in uh, 2021. We've already undertaken eight special integrity reviews on uh, focused sovereign projects. Um, and we've got four already undergoing. Uh, we do this all remotely and we also utilise consultants on the <clears> ground. <throat> Another thing we did is um, some of you may be aware that the Asian Development Bank um, in the beginning of 2021 uh, released something known as the Asia Pacific Vaccine Access Facility, otherwise known as APVAX. Mm -hmm. it, uh, it's a vaccine access facility for $9 billion allocated budget. And what we did was to ensure that we were looking at corruption and other integrity risks, whilst we had to um, rapidly deploy these projects to developing member countries to, um, to fund vaccines and also to facilitate vaccine rollout, including cold chain infrastructure, is we formed a 180B approach to ensure that um, a lot of functions got together and they were actually for once really seeing each other's risks. And it gave the Office of Anti-Corruption and Integrity the opportunity to um, undertake real risk assessments in these projects at project development stage and put in recommendations to strengthen anti-corruption and integrity and then monitor these projects as they go live and during their life cycle. Thank you very much, uh, Hannah. Uh, why don't we uh, finish off with you on this question and then the next question I'm actually going to start with you. So why don't you finish off on this one? Okay, thanks. Well, I wish I could say we would do lots of new things, but to be realistic, we are part of an international multilateral diplomatic mm -hmm. organization. So there is a limit to how innovative we can be. But what we can say is we definitely won't give up. And we have we do our baseline evaluations in Greco at the moment. We are focusing on preventing corruption in central government and law enforcement. We have a compliance procedure after that that runs for years, where we hold try to hold member states to their recommendations. And that we will definitely continue to do. Our focus is very much on implementation because that is the basic challenge. Everybody knows it. Countries have often started, even completed uh, legal reforms, and then they stop or they even reverse those legal reforms. And that's a huge problem. So we will just continue to focus on, on our compliance work as much as we can. Well, we might as well start with you on the third question. Uh, Frank, uh, before we do that, what are your thoughts? Frank, I think yeah. you're on mute. Well, no. Yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't want to really interrupt. I just want to make just two points, if I may. Um, first, the United Nations has said that in 2020, $89 billion flowed out of Sub-Saharan Africa illicitly, which is twice the amount of foreign aid that went in. Now, none of the panelists so far have even addressed that issue. Uh, Edward says they, the World Bank talks to governments. Many of those <laughs> governments are kleptocrats. Uh, none of the panelists have mentioned the use of civil society. The World Bank and the Asian Development Bank are not doing large scale funding directly of in-country civil society <laughs> to monitor the programs. Instead, we have all of this new jargon about technology when there are people on the ground who could help. I must tell you, uh, Bill and my fellow panelists, I urge you, look, we've got a crisis. This isn't a time for yet another new action plan. And as for the banks, when you look at what Goldman Sachs did in Malaysia and you look at what Credit Suisse did in Mozambique, don't tell me that there's more compliance than all the rest of it. We are seeing billions of dollars of criminal activity through money laundering through the biggest banks, many of the biggest banks in the world. And so I'm urging you, please use this opportunity now to tell us concretely what we're gonna do about these kind of things and how you're gonna use civil society to actually hold people's feet to the fire. Sorry about that intervention, Bill, thank you. Uh, well, I think uh, we can see the passion that Frank has and that we all should have on this subject, and I'm sure you do. Hannah, uh, Greco has an excellent reputation over 20 years now on following <clears throat> the problems of corruption. Uh, and uh, particularly 
you've done a lot of work with the EU, uh, but what do you think uh, should be done? And what do you think the organizations uh, that are represented here should do uh, if it finds uh, one of its members uh, actually not complying with recommendations or observations that have been issued in each valuation around? Uh, what sort of sanctions should be imposed? What sort of publicity should be given? Uh, what needs to be done to really put this on the front pages uh, to make people react, uh, uh, you know, particularly governments to react, but also the private sector? Uh, that's a tough question, but I start off with you because Greco has a very excellent reputation over the last 20 years on, on this particular subject. Thanks, that's very kind. I've only been here for a year, so I don't take credit for any of that. I think my reply, whatever I say, I will disappoint Mr. Fogel, I'm afraid, because we, there's a limit to what we can do. And part of the work that Greco does is precisely behind the scenes. So we have a confidential procedure and then afterwards there's a publicity part. But I think the publicity part alone will not get us very far. I think whether we like mm -hmm. it or not, if you work with the mm -hmm. government and that's what we do within this particular organization, then you need a minimum of trust and you need to be able to speak to them openly. I'm sure my fellow panelists have a lot of experience with that as well. But then afterwards, obviously, that is never the whole picture. What we do in Greco, it's very traditional intergovernmental monitoring work. I think it has its place, but obviously it cannot be the only point of pressure or the only entry point. It has to be complemented by all the work being done by those who have access to the media and can go straight to the media and say whatever they wish in whatever form they like. And, and, and naming and shaming in a way that we could never do and which is not our role to do. Likewise, our work, as I said, when we do on-site visits, for example, we meet with mm -hmm. the government, but then we meet with civil society and they provide information. And afterwards they go out and do the advocacy work. They draw attention to the corruption. They, they try and make sure that the governments feel compelled to engage with us. I, I, that's how I see the relationship. Um, I don't think I want to say anything more than that, but just to underline that our role within an organization like the Council of Europe is, I think, not to name a shame, but what we can do is to link this to human rights protection. Nobody has mentioned human rights until now. I think sometimes if you come at this from the angle of <laughs> democracy, of course, rule of law, but also human rights, you engage a whole new audience and you, <clears throat> you, um, you create a, um, a focus which is different and there are instruments that come into play which don't come into play if you only look at the criminal law aspect. So for, for Greco, the human rights aspect is very important. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Hannah. Ed, uh, the World Bank has a lot of clout. Uh, I think the World Bank has more clout today uh, than it's ever, than it's had since uh, the high, you know, the high mark of McNamara and Wolfenson. Uh, so, what do you think the World Bank should be doing in the sense of making these <clears throat> acts public and really, you know, doing something or trying to do something about it? Because you have the unique ability of withholding funds if you want to. I think you're on mute, Ed. Thanks, you go. Uh, Bill. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so I think uh, we we have developed a good framework in terms of how to deal with this issue of corruption in client countries. Uh, so we, I mean, we have to recognize that, for instance, when we provide funding to countries, the funds we are providing, they are meant to be able to help reduce poverty. And so you take the case, say, we provide funding to support, uh, say, a reduction of malaria. Mm -hmm. Malaria affects more poor people, uh, yeah. richer people, if they get infected, they can get better treatment for themselves. So we have to have a very decent way to be able to manage issues when there are corruption. Now, uh, we review all allegations of fraud and corruption. Um, and we follow a certain process, which is guided by a framework that is already established in the institution. And part of the framework was reviewed by Paul Foka that you, you mentioned earlier on. Um, we, I mean, if following our investigations, if there are thing, allegations of corruption that are substantiated, we impose sanctions against firms and individuals. And we make this public, okay? Where we, including, where firms being debarred for some periods, okay? So that's what we do. 
Now, our focus as a, a, a development institution is really on proper accountability for fraud and corruption that impact on the operations that we finance. And with the aim that, to deter any of such behaviors in future. So in some cases, I also must say that we do have companies themselves even coming forward, mm -hmm. okay, to inform us that they have found violations or they have been involved in, in violations. Okay, in these cases, what we then do is we uh, use the remedial aspect of our action, which is improving compliance systems. And that can play a stronger uh, a role in helping to prevent uh, future misconduct. Now, I have to say that as a development institutions, uh, our investigations normally center on our policies. We cannot really handle uh, the national criminal laws. So the sanctions that we also impose, they are administrative in nature. And I don't think there can be criminal in nature. Now, if in the course of our investigation, we do find uh, that countries' laws have been violated, we normally refer that to the countries so that they can deal with it, I mean, investigate and deal with it in their own ways. And given the framework, that's about what we, we, we can do. But if there are issues or challenges with our projects, uh, then we take appropriate functions, I mean, actions. There are cases where we pause funding, we investigate, we <laughs> sanction, uh, and then we take appropriate action, but with the overall uh, emphasis on ensuring that we protect the interests of the poor, because the uh, projects we are financing in the first instance, they are meant to have some benefits or impact on, on the poor. And say, just cutting them uh, 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 radically or can have negative impact and consequences on those people that we are trying to protect in the first uh, instance. Well, I know that uh, David Malpas uh, feels strongly on this. And every time I interview him, Ed, I always bring this up as an important element, uh, given the tradition of uh, Jim Wolfenson at, at the bank. Uh, OK, uh, Lisa. Uh, you've sort of Thanks. disappeared from the screen, but I'm glad you're back. Sorry. <laughs> During COVID times, if anybody's got a bit of a sniff, even if it's remotely, people seem to get a bit concerned. Um, so um, in line with what Ed said, um, we also undertake the same. We take a, we do prevention and compliance work. Um, our focus is on uh, reducing extreme poverty in our developing member countries. We do sanction entities uh, for 2020, uh, sorry, 2021, we sanctioned uh, 20 entities, uh, sorry, 30 entities and individuals. We take um, also other uh, reprimand action if they are not actually uh, debarred or temporarily suspended. And uh, similar to what Ed said as well, we also have um, entities coming to us from developing member countries or even the executing agencies themselves coming to us reporting of potential integrity violations, which actually can harm the development projects. So I don't have much more to add to what uh, Ed's actually said because we've got very uh, similar um, models of operation. Thank you very much, uh, Frank. You know, <clears throat> I'm listening to this and I'm thinking, come on, get real. You're talking about sanctions, Ed, Lisa. You're talking about sanctioning companies that are caught doing fraudulent activities on your projects. You're not talking about sanctioning governments. <laughs> You're not talking about how you are really turning up the dialogue when you are lending money to totally kleptocratic regimes and you are doing it. If anybody wanted to read the report of the trust fund that the World Bank managed with, for 34 donors mm -hmm. countries in Afghanistan, it's a disaster. And nobody at the bank took respons personal responsibility and resigned. The president of the bank ignored the issue absolutely completely. Billions of, of dollars were lost and missing. 10 billion was allocated. <laughs> That's the AP, it's the World Bank. And you're talking about sanctions on companies that do things in your small projects. We are talking about a global problem and the unwillingness of the bank and the other de development banks to really get political 
we have your leaders now talking on global climate issues in a really forceful way, but they've stopped talking about corruption and human mm -hmm. rights. And here, Hannah, I could totally agree with you. And I just want to add, please go to transparency.org today. Look at the Corruption Index mm -hmm. report because it looks at democracy's challenge and human rights. And we have to put these things together. And we can't really focus all our attention on doing a little bit more about sanctioning companies on your particular project. Yes, that's great. But frankly, the house is on fire. There's a crisis. Please step up the game and talk to governments, kleptocratic governments, and say to them, we will not lend to you unless you change the activities you are doing. Because the situation today, you are lending to many countries that are mm -hmm. governments that are stealing your money, our money. Thank you very much. As you can see, Frank feels very passionate on the subject. And I must say that we, when we had our interviews with Kristalina at the IMF and David Malpas uh, at the annual meetings, uh, we called on Frank to bring this subject to their attention. Uh, and they waxed very, I wouldn't say poetic, but very strongly that they were gonna look into this area. Uh, and as you can see, Frank uh, uh, in his career path had times at the World Bank working with Jim Wolfenson on uh, this subject with off, oftentimes gets submerged when we think about COVID and everything else going on in the world. Chin Wei, I'm gonna end with you on this uh, particular uh, question and then I'm gonna start with you on the next one. So please give me your thoughts. And then on the next one, which will relate particularly to the banking and financial area, I'm gonna start with you, but let's end this one, uh, this question with, with you. Thank you. Yes, just a few uh, areas I wanted to highlight in this space, which we haven't touched on yet. I think the individual prosecutions are critical for um, to send a message. So when we think about sanctions and what's effective, so one that comes to mind is the former prime minister of Malaysia. Um, I know Frank mentioned Malaysia. He's very passionate about that, among other things. So I think that was a really strong message. Um, the former president of South Korea, who was recently pardoned due to health reasons. But I think when we have these uh, leaders uh, being held accountable mm -hmm. through criminal prosecution, I think it does send a message. We've also seen a lot of cooperation across various regulators. And I know we'll talk a little bit more about some of the items in the banking sector. But I think when you see uh, regulators from the US, the UK, Singapore, Hong Kong, all coming together to send a clear message um, to companies and to countries and saying this sort of behavior is not acceptable and it will not go unnoticed. I think that's a really, really important thing. And I think it's important that we highlight um, that we highlight that. In addition, I just also wanted to note that from an institutional perspective, city has turned down projects due to corruption concerns. And that's not something you'll see on the news, but but it does happen. So I think, and that's part of how we, it, as we think through responsible finance, as, as, as we think through our goal in enabling progress, we take very seriously that um, that the companies and the and the, uh, the the governments that we do business with are adhering to the highest ethical standards. And we look across the vendor relationships, the various relationships in connection with the transaction and perform robust due diligence. The last area I wanted to flag, and I think it's really critical is, and this again goes to some of the points that Frank was making, which is the OECD flagged the importance in their recent guidance, mm -hmm. which was issued, the importance of looking and penalizing the, the um, requesters, the demand side of bribery. We see a lot of enforcement around the payers of the bribe, the people who are making these large payments, whether they're companies or individuals. But we need to see a lot more accountability mm -hmm. on the demand side, because that really is uh, the root cause. And, and in a lot of instances, having the right cultures, not only among government officials, but also across um, public institutions, I think is really critical. So on to the fourth question, which I'm really excited to talk about. And I'll let you okay. start off, Bill. Well, we'll start with, with you on this fourth question, which leads right into what you were saying is, we have, we have these various important institutions, uh, 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 multilateral institutions on this call. And we also have you representing the private sector. 
Uh, but what is being done to actually turn down loans uh, when, you, uh, when you have know your customer, which goes back to the core of banking and, uh, and, and financial, I think, <clears throat> regulation and, and uh, you know, financial uh, management. And it's known in the banking world and the financial world as know your customer. Uh, and the question I ask for you is how often do institutions really turn down loans, whether they be from the private sector or the multilateral, but in this case, the private sector, because I'm, I'm talking to you, uh, on the basis of what they see as perceived corruption, kickbacks, whatever. Uh, I led a group um, of, of, of uh, people at the uh, group of 30 heads of central banks, uh, members of the private sector, uh, in a series of reports on uh, culture and, uh, <clears throat> and corruption. Uh, and in these reports, uh, we, you know, we particularly called for know your customer, uh, uh, you know, the, and it's not just the culture you have to have, but the conduct. In other words, it's nice to talk about it, but how do you practice it? Uh, and among others, we interviewed, uh, uh, because I was long since retired uh, from Citibank, where I was chair and president and CEO, uh, we asked the uh, then uh, CEO of Citibank and the then chair of the board of Citibank and the major institutions worldwide on the subject of, of culture and conduct. And I'd, I'd just like you to, to maybe go a little bit more in depth on how you see that really functioning uh, and I hope that you will make sure that all your colleagues in, in, uh, in city actually pick up those reports and look at them. But uh, if you could give some examples without naming countries or uh, individuals, how this process actually works uh, in the private sector. And then I will call on each of you who represent development institutions as to whether you're practicing uh, the same type of uh, of let's say overview and action uh, that we're talking about here. So with that long-winded uh, introduction uh, and question, Chen Wei, I turn it over to you. And on the point of long-winded, I will say that this is a topic that we can spend hours on. I think we'll, I'll try to be as uh, concise as possible, just considering the amount of time that we have and hope to do some justice to a topic that I think is very, it really is a very complex one. But um, I think uh, to the point that you made, uh, Bill, around um, conduct, I think a lot of banks and also speaking from our financial institutions perspective, really un understands the importance of setting the appropriate tone at the top. So at the board of directors level, ensuring that there's accountability with focus committees that are looking at culture, conduct, in through metrics and, and measurable results. So that's one piece. So it starts at the top. And then at the senior management levels and mid-manager levels and throughout the organization, ensuring that there's a clear understanding of what the expectations are in connection with bribery, corruption, and other ethical issues, and making sure that people are held accountable. So one of the things that we've seen across a lot of enforcement actions is you may have bad actors within an institution and they've gone unnoticed, either because people did not raise their hands or because when those actions were um, identified, there were not appropriate, um, there wasn't appropriate discipline on the conduct. And so part of what uh, best practices um, uh, involve is making sure that you're looking across the board on the conduct of employees and that there are consequences and that those consequences are clear, everything from policy reminders for really minor issues up to termination for severe um, behaviors and making sure that there are compensation uh, um, uh, uh, consequences for, for behaviors and that all of that is clear. So I think that's one piece of it, which is the accountability piece. Um, I think the other piece that we saw in a lot of the enforcement actions as well has to do with due diligence on transactions, having effective end-to-end -end due diligence. So not just checking a box and saying we have X transaction and we know it's a complicated transaction, but making sure that there are clear due diligence measures and when red flags are identified, that those are addressed. I think one of the pieces that I wanted to highlight in connection with the role of banks, and as we think about um, some of these uh, governments, um, 
is that it's difficult for a bank to know what happens end to end within a government, but it's possible for a bank to follow through on red flags. So if due diligence is in depth enough and it's, and it's done at a level that really does look at the various aspects of a transaction, it is possible to identify red flags and how you handle those red flags is what's critical. The seriousness that's given to it and how those are addressed and whether a bank, for example, decides not to engage in the transaction at all. And I think a, a number of banks, I can't speak for other banks, but I can tell you that Citi um, has turned down transactions. We have turned down uh, third parties as well, um, individuals or institutions that uh, based on transaction due diligence and red flags, we decided we will not do business with. I would also flag that because we have um, employees on the ground in a lot of countries, it is very helpful because we are able to embed ourselves with the grassroots. We work very closely with, with civil society and with other stakeholders in various countries around the world. And so we have the ability to peel back the onion. We're not relying on a couple of bankers or we're not relying on what a third party represents to us. So I think that's been a critical piece of it as well. So I think, again, that proactive organized approach across the organization so that you're able to identify red flags when they surface and act on them, I think is really critical. So that's my quick think, uh, subject, uh, which yeah, we can spend on, five hours talking about, yeah. All right, well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I think one of the things I'd add to your list is really trying to promote the whole idea of whistleblowing, whether it be in the private sector or the official sector. Uh, and we haven't seen enough of that. And that was one of the key points of the Group of 30 report. I see you have looked through it because you mentioned some of the key, uh, the key points. But it's not just the private sector. It's also the uh, multilateral institutions have to practice uh, the same. So having said that, Ed, uh, uh, are you practicing those same points uh, within the World Bank that Chin Wei uh, uh, has just run through? Uh, thanks, we do have an approach uh, that is somewhat, uh, I mean, not exactly similar to what Chin Wei uh, described because I think they operating in the private sector, uh, but we have uh, an approach that mm -hmm. we use. But before I explain my approach, I really do want to, kind of uh, have a quick response to what Frank said earlier on. I mean, Frank knows the World Bank, okay? Uh, and uh, we have a similar model as the African, uh, I mean, the Asian Development Bank. Now, we, we, why we have the sanctioning system that I explained, as Frank knows, part of what we are also doing is that we do actually uh, engage in dialogue with the countries that, where, I mean, where we work, the clients, the authorities, we engage with them on issues that do border on, on, on corruption. And part of what we have been working on is getting them to introduce measures that we introduce, I mean, that will reduce corruption. For instance, through the, poly, uh, the uh, budget support that we, pro we, 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 we provide to them. Uh, like part of the measures we are already, uh, we are currently promoting and supporting through uh, the, uh, the budget instrument is uh, beneficial ownership transparency reforms. Okay, and I think that will help. Uh, there are other measures like, for instance, having more transparent exchange mechanism in different, I mean, different things that we support that are supposed to bring transparency and reduce opportunity for corruption. And we engage in that with governments. There are cases where we stop using certain instruments in certain countries because we believe that uh, it's, uh, it's open to corruption and uh, we use instruments that we have better control over and we can be able to effectively supervise the flow of funds, okay? But at the end of the day, we have to keep the poor in mind because you stop the flow, uh, it's not necessarily those in power that are going to be affected. I gave the example of malaria uh, earlier on. It's uh, the poor people that will be affected if you stop supporting uh, malaria. Now, let me come to the framework. What we do as a, as a bank uh, is, we have uh, upfront before we start providing the fund, we do various assessments, institutional assessment. We do assessment in the sectors that we want to engage. We do assessment of the public finance systems. Okay, and we have current up-to-date information about this, the risks and how to mitigate the risks. So we design our projects based on our understanding of the systems and the risks. And we build in, the risk mitigation measures. As Shinwei was also saying, 
we have um, a staff in all the countries where we work. We have procurement staff, we have financial management staff, we have uh, technical staff who are engaged in monitoring the projects, reviewing procurement packages, uh, reviewing the records of governments and so on and so forth. So we do monitor these things on, uh, on, a, uh, on a regular basis. Now, we have also a department that has expertise to be able to investigate when there are issues of fraud. So those fraud issues are investigated and actions are taken as appropriate. Uh, then when we have done a project, we also have the way of learning from what we have done in a particular sector, on, in a particular project, in a particular country, and factoring that lesson into whatever we do in that country, in that sector, as a repeat operation or even in a different uh, uh, sector. So that's the approach we, we take. Back to you, Bill. Okay, thank you. Uh, Lisa, how do you feel uh, listening to these presentations uh, how do you feel at the Asian Development Bank? Because the Asian Development Bank is the second all after you had the World Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank, and then the Asian Development Bank. And uh, you've graduated a lot of very, very important people from that institution, including uh, Kuroda-san, who runs the, uh, the uh, <clears throat> Central Bank of Japan. And so you've had some very important people go through your institution, including uh, the present head of the Asian Infrastructure and Investment Bank, uh, Jin, in China. So your institution has a lot of clout in, uh, in Asia. How do you feel on, uh, on this particular subject? I think it's very, very important because uh, the fastest growing area in the world is Asia. We're very passionate about it. Um, we uh, undertake a very robust uh, into what we call integrity due diligence. So it's wider than um, know your customer. It's actually looking at all the integrity risks of uh, potential counterparts in the project and the project itself. So we look at the project risk and also the counterpart risk, and we look at um, we look at it from uh, quite the wide. Um, we look at it from an all risk perspective. So it's like, um, uh, as Shen Wei was saying, you know, uh, City has now formed a, a financial, uh, sorry, brought together financial crime compliance. So we look at it um, even in a wider remit. So we look at it from uh, a governance perspective. Um, excuse me, sorry. So um, we look at it from an accountability perspective, uh, participation, predictability. We make sure that there's interlinkages with, um, uh, with the elements of good governance. And so we're not just looking at from an from a anti-money laundering perspective or countering of financing perspective, or um, we're, we're making sure that we have quite a, a holistic, robust look at these projects right from the beginning, pre at, at concept stage, building in control mechanisms at the project development stage, having monitoring in place ongoing. And then we also have our investigations arm, which actually also undertakes investigations. We also then um, make sure that we do uh, proper, uh, what we call uh, capacity development with our developing member countries, uh, particularly the uh, implementing and executing agencies, which are more often than not government agencies. And we do very proactive outreach to them. One benefit of us all working remotely is we have been able to do a great deal more outreach than we ever could. So um, last year we did very um, thematic outreach to particular high risk projects, um, those that oversee mm -hmm. and execute them. And, uh, but we also did thematic outreach on um, vaccine, integrity risk and vaccine programs with the OECD and the UN. And we also held uh, sessions, uh, wide outreach in relation to ADB sanctions, including um, multilateral sanctions, sorry, multilateral bank sanctions that we recognize. So we look at it from uh, quite a robust uh, compliance framework element perspective, where we have all the prevention and the detection mechanisms and also the investigative mechanisms. And we're very passionate about it. Thank you very much. Uh, Hannah, before we... Uh finalize here. Do you have any comments uh, on this? Uh, because I'm going to ask Frank to close it out and then we're going to have uh, uh, questions. Hannah? 
Thanks. Well, in Greco, we don't make loans to anybody, so I'll be really brief. But I just want to echo what was said about the protection of whistleblowers, because that's something we pay a lot of attention to as well. The Council of Europe has adopted a recommendation with guidance to states about how they can set up whistle protection uh, blower schemes, and that has become the basis of an EU directive, so we are pleased about that. Also in Greco, we have actually looked at whistleblower protection schemes and legislation in our member states on our fifth round, and the tendency is that there are more and more such uh, legislative frameworks and schemes, but they're quite recent. There's not a lot of experience implementing them. So that will be something to follow to see how all these new schemes are actually used and if they are used and, and in what way. Thanks. Yes, well, I think uh, the EU is very important because they're one of the largest official uh, <clears throat> uh, lenders to the developing world where a lot of these problems are. So your oversight is very, very important. Frank, uh, why don't you close this session out uh, very quickly and then we have to open it up to questions. Thank you, Bill. Um, <clears throat> Thank you, Bill. Uh, first of all, I've beaten up on all of you, so uh, with no apology. But uh, <laughs> let me just say, we started Transparency International 30 years ago with the idea that we would work in a multi-stakeholder approach, seeking partnership with the private sector, with the public sector. Uh, I am the chair of the Partnership for Transparency Fund, we work very closely with the ADB. We work very closely with the World Bank uh, with great respect. Um, we need, I think, to find ways to ramp up our game together. I think if we don't all work together, we're not going to achieve what we need to achieve. Uh, I think if I may just make a couple of points on all the things that have been said. First of all, on the last point on culture, uh, Bill, you've done a remarkable work with a group of 30 reports. They are must reading and they're very, very important. And I think, uh, Chinwe, if I may say so, uh, I have a chapter in my book that says ticking the boxes is not enough. And there is too much in banking compliance and other compliance that's ticking the boxes. Uh, not a single chairman of one of the world's top 10 major non-Chinese banks that's been caught with money laundering has ever been forced out of his position, let alone personally prosecuted. There's no personal responsibility being taken at the top, just as there wasn't with the subprime crisis. You're right about the tone of the top, but people will only believe there's cultural change when the very top people also say, yes, I was at fault and take the consequences. And we're not seeing enough of that, if I may say so. Uh, on uh, the very important point that Hannah made at the beginning, rule of law, human rights, it's something that brings us all together. And frankly, we're losing. The trend of uh, authoritarianism relative to democracy is going the wrong way. And I, I, we can't be complacent. And I would argue we have to find ways, civil society, the public sector, the private sector, to come together in some sort of way that actually ramps up what is being done. We can't just have the nice conversations at the World Economic Forum where everybody feels good and then nothing changes. There really has to be some concrete measures. And I call on all of you to find ways that you can work with us in civil society to do that. Uh, the very last point I make is, um, I believe that many of the institutions that we are representing here have a common interest in preserving the democracy and the security that we enjoy so much that has led to so much of our own personal uh, happiness and success and freedom. And I don't think the corruption yeah. issue is getting the traction that it needs in this crisis. And I hope very much that this discussion today uh, can heighten a, the sense of crisis. Because if it doesn't, then the Putins and the Xi's of this world will gain more and more power and the weakness of democracies will be ever more exposed so that populists like Donald Trump can win. I think that would be terrible for the world as a whole. And I think that's exactly where we are today. So Bill, thank you very much indeed for convening this meeting.
Well, I think just the final point, because we're going to turn it over to Emily for questions. Uh, I think in all of what we're talking about, at the end of the day, it's that old expression, actions speak louder than words. And I think that's what we really need to see uh, on this area of corruption. And this is why the group of uh, 30 did their report, which I chaired. But very importantly, here at Bretton Woods, uh, in the spirit of Jim Wolfenson and Paul Volcker, we really rate this as a very high priority, as, as Emily knows, uh, who's uh, the managing director and the glue that holds uh, Bretton Woods together. And uh, that's why we're having this session. Uh, and I hope uh, that we have a chance to distribute this video uh, as, uh, as widely as possible, Emily. So I turn it over to you to end it, to take the questions and uh, thank all our panelists uh, you know, for their work, their passion uh, and your dedication to this particular subject. Emily? Yeah, thank you, Bill. And um, yeah, thank you, Frank, for being our provocateur. Um, as always, uh, I really enjoyed the discussion, as did our audience, because we have a ton of questions. And um, unfortunately, uh, probably not enough time to get to all of them. Um, but I'm going to first go to Coral mm -hmm. Dawson, um, who's a BWC member, and she has a really good question that um, integrates with some of BWC's other work. So um, Coral, I would ask you to unmute your microphone and please pose your question. Thank you. Uh, my question is really about cryptocurrency and the difficulty in tracking where money is flowing today. So, you know, the added layer of not actually being able to, once something is moved or you've agreed to loan it, being able to actually know where it goes out and where it's, I mean, honestly, there's just not a lot of infrastructure today and part of its attractiveness is its complexity. So I'm wondering how all of you all are approaching it. I mean, it's already happening. You hear it, you know, even on a retail basis, there's a lot of fraud happening. So I'm wondering, um, you know, how are you all set up to address that? Chenwei, you want to make a comment on that? And then I'll open it to any of our other uh, speakers who would like to comment. Um, so it's not something that we directly offer as a service, as you may know, but we are working a number of our businesses whose clients are involved in this. We're working with a number of vendors. We have a few vendor tools that 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 um, actually track um, various aspects of of of, um, of um, cryptocurrencies. So that's just at a, at a high level how how we're addressing it. Any of the others of you would like to make a comment on this? Yes, Frank. Very briefly, um, when I was doing research for my book, uh, I talked to somebody at the FBI about the use of cryptocurrencies uh, in kleptocracy. The view was authoritarian regimes, the government kleptocrats and their pals, look for safe investments. Uh, we haven't talked about beneficial ownership. We haven't talked about shell companies and so on today, but we maybe should have. So they're not in the view of the FBI, so far, they're not very involved. Those kleptocrats and the way they launder their money are not very involved with cryptocurrencies, whereas organized crime very much is. And I make just that distinction because um, I think it's very interesting. Uh, the more the cryptocurrencies become stable, I'd say regulated, safer as investments, I think we will see authoritarian kleptocrats using them more and more. And there's a lot of work going on at the FBI right now to try to understand this better and to look precisely at that aspect of corruption uh, and money laundering and the role of virtual currencies. Do any of the others of you have points that you'd like to make uh, on this, I think very important question that uh, Coral has asked us about, because that's the reality of the world we're living in at this point. Okay, Emily, uh, pass it back to you. Uh, yeah, thanks, Bill. Um, next, we're going to go to uh, Lawrence Cocroft, and um, he has a question also on another work stream of BWC, so I'm interested uh, to, to hear everyone's response on this. Um, Lawrence, would you please go ahead? Uh, yeah, I would like to raise the issue of the enormous expected increase in financial flows in relation to climate change. So we've had announcements originating from COP26 that suggest we're going to have an incremental $100 billion a year flowing mainly from the developing world, from the developed world to the developing world. 
And my question is, if this is going to flow, how are we going to ensure that it isn't actually flowing into various forms of corruption, given the problems we've been talking about in relation to existing flows? Ed, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Because I know this is something that the World Bank is, uh, is looking at. Uh, thank you. So um, I think our approach to this is really uh, to uh, work with our clients, okay, and really make sure that we have an assessment done up front. And that in the various assessments we are doing, that we are able to identify uh, whatever gaps, uh, risk, and how that can be mitigated. So that then when funds are flowing, then we design the flow of funds in a way that include appropriate risk uh, uh, mitigation. So as you all know, or may know, I mean, some of you will know, we do have uh, already a very robust fiduciary standard in the, in the World Bank. And I think the same similar standards are applied in other development banks as well. So that standard requires certain due diligence for us to be done, I mean, to, for us to do before the funds start flowing. And for us to also continue to do due diligence all through uh, the times that funds are flowing, okay? So that's precisely what uh, we will be doing uh, at the World Bank. I mean, you would have seen uh, COVID, uh, we, I mean, we learned almost one, is it 160 billion over a period of less than 18 months? Uh, I mean, we worked hard to really uh, safeguard uh, uh, the money. Uh, I'm not sure you have had so much, I mean, stories about uh, World Bank funds being, uh, uh, being misapplied or misused. So we intend to apply the same due diligence and uh, rigorous fiduciary standards to uh, the flow of money uh, relating to uh, climate change. Thanks. Please. Do you have any comments on this? I don't think uh, you have your, uh, I think you're muted. Uh, Hannah, do you have any comments? No, I'll pass on this one. It's outside my remit. Thanks. Chen Wei. So just a quick comment saying that we will apply our um, due diligence processes around those um, those flows as well. And of course, depending on the, the countries and the nature of the transactions that will uh, determine the extent of the enhancements to the due diligence. So there will be enhanced due diligence around those as well. Okay, uh, Frank, any point on this? Okay, Emily, next question. It was a very good, both questions have been very, uh, very, very uh, well stated and very, very important. Emily? Yes, yes, Bill, as I said, cryptocurrencies and climate change also of interest to BWC. Um, I think we have time for one last question and um, forgive me if I mispronounce the name, but uh, Michael Gijic has a question. So um, Michael, I'm going to go to you. Can you please unmute your microphone, Michael? Michael, do we have? Sorry, uh, yep. uh, I had written it out. Well, the Biden administration has identified the Global Anti-Corruption Consortium, which involves investigative journalists and civil society organizations as the linchpin of its efforts. So my question is how uh, might uh, the, the panelists exploit this or take advantage of this, particularly with regard to the due diligence or know your customer requirements before you make loans or suspend them. And actually, uh, as an addition to the suspension, one of the things that uh, occurs with regard to civil society organizations and loans they re uh, receive is that they are defamed <laughs> by kleptocrats. So it may be important to uh, develop a process to be able to uh, ascertain whether uh, that is going on as well. So your thoughts on that? Yeah, Chen Wei, do you have a, anything you'd like to say on that? Nothing specific, just that I know it's it's fairly early on. So we'll have to see how the consortium operates, but I think it does sound promising based on what we've seen. Frank? 
Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, first of all, it's wonderful that my great friends, Lawrence and Michael, both are on the program and both have asked questions. Um, I think I'd like to just take one aspect of Michael's comment. I, I opened this uh, today by, amongst other things, talking about protecting journalists and protecting civic space. And I think I, it's really encouraging that Samantha Power, uh, the administrator of USAID, uh, has really emphasized that in looking at the new strategies for USAID against corruption and in support of human rights. It is very encouraging the Biden administration is doing it too. We are not seeing quite the same level of support in the EU and in the UK. Uh, there's a lot of rhetoric, but we're not really seeing the concrete actions. And I would just emphasize, if you read the papers this week, a leading editor in Turkey has just been arrested. Uh, why? For quotes, insulting the president. Um, we are gonna see more and more journalists under threat in the period immediately ahead and more and more civic space under threat. And so I think the more that we all can do, civil society, private sector, public sector together, to really ring the alarm bells and demand that our governments do far more to protect freedom of speech, freedom of the media and civil society across the world is gonna be absolutely crucial. If we don't do that, I don't see us making real progress in many of the areas that we've already talked about today. And I think we all have a responsibility there. Thank you, Bill. Anna, would you like to comment on that? I would just like to agree and say that freedom of the media is key and it should never be the ones who expose corruption who pay the price for it. It should be the ones responsible for the corruption. At the moment, we are seeing a little bit the, the reverse. So completely agree. Okay, uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, if you have any uh, final comment on this, Lisa? I think we've lost Lisa. What about you, Ed? Thanks, Bill. Um, I would say that I also agree with what Frank had said, which was echoed by uh, Anne. Uh, but I also want to use this opportunity to uh, state uh, an obvious uh, uh, fact. And that is the war against corruption is not going to be won by just one method, one tool, or one approach. If that were possible, I think then the problem of corruption would have been put behind us. So this is a major daunting challenge that requires various approaches, whatever can be done to really tackle. If we are taking it as an emergency that Frank calls it, I don't think you just approach it using one, one method, okay? So we will look at, for instance, at this uh, Global Anti-Corruption Consortium and see how we can build on it. Just as we work with civil society, we look at different things and so on and so forth. I don't think, for instance, that one method, say civil society organization or that or this alone, will make a dent on corruption. I think we need to master all the tools, all the approaches available. And we try to document some of those things in the global report on anti-corruption that we published last year, where we identify tools that have worked, the conditions under which they work and how they can be made to, to work. So uh, that's where I, I will come, come through. Like in our action plan we are developing, we'll take a look at this, we'll see how we can build on the initiative. Thank you. Well, thank you for ending it, I think, on that note, which I think encompasses all of what we've been trying to say here. And uh, I think it's very important that our audience understand, before I thank our speakers, how important uh, the Bretton Woods organization feels about this subject, because frankly, there aren't enough groups like ours that really are putting this up front uh, in, uh, uh, you know, in importance. Uh, and I'd like, as I said, to thank all our speakers from around the world. Some of you, particularly down under, have, uh, have come for, you know, uh, stayed up half the night to do this, but we thank you all. I want to thank Elena from uh, our staff uh, and Emily for working on this. And uh, I think we're off to a good beginning here, Emily, to follow up on this in the future. So I turn it back to you to, uh, to finalize it and end it. 
Yeah, Bill, thank you. Um, and I'll just echo your appreciation for our panelists today. Thank you all for joining us. Um, as, as you've highlighted, this is a, a far reaching problem that cuts across um, all sectors of the global economy and, and really society at large and um, really is going to require collective action to address. So just want to thank you all. Um, and I'm sorry we couldn't get all to the uh, to all of the audience questions, but I very much appreciate uh, everyone attending today. And with that, we will sign off. Thanks again, everyone. Thank you all. Thank you.